We are studying Psalm 25 in the Bibles this morning. Psalm 25. Anybody here heard of Woody Allen before? Everybody knows who Woody Allen is? He's not my hero. Um, he's certainly a godless man. But he said something that uh, some of you might identify with. He said, my one regret in life is that I was not born someone else. <laughs> my one regret in life is that I was not born someone else. Do you have any regrets for who you are this morning? That's the question I'd like to start with. Regrets. I'm, I don't think that anybody can go through life without having regrets. I have regrets. A regret, according to the dictionary, is grief or pain that you have that's tinged with disappointment or longing or remorse for something you've done in the past or not done in the past. It's all related to our life experiences. The things that we failed to do or the things that we did that we shouldn't have done causes us grief or pain and disappointment, longing that we had done it differently, or remorse. That is the subject, by the way, of Psalm 25. Psalm 25 is in the Bible to help us learn how to avoid regretting life how to avoid regretting life the reason I say this is because in the 22 verses here written by King David who lived 10 centuries before Jesus Christ we have words that are very appropriate very practical very applicable to our own lives David talks about in verse 7 something that every one of us in this room can identify with that usually we have regrets over. He says, remember not the sins of my youth. Is there any one of us that has gone through youth or those of you who are in the process that don't regret something you did then <laughs> or perhaps are doing now? Things that you have done that you regret. You wish you hadn't done it. You, There's a longing inside of you that you would have been different in such and such a circumstance. Yes, uh, if we're honest with ourselves, we all wish we had done things differently. That's only one of the, the signposts in this psalm that indicates that David is thinking of the things that he wished had not happened to him or wished were not happening to him. And the 22 verses of Psalm 25 are basically a prayer of David. They're a prayer. David is uh, older now at the time that he's writing this psalm. And he's thinking of his youth. He regrets the mistakes that he made. We've already read that verse. In this psalm, David obviously is carrying heavy responsibility. There are many decisions that he has to make. There are choices. There are options from which he has to pick and on which he has to work there are ways out there, different paths for him to take. And he's a king of the country. He has a whole court full of people that are sitting in judgment on his judgments. Anybody that's had a position of responsibility knows what it's like to be in that position. It's, it's nice in some respects because you have the privileges of, that go along with that position, don't you? But you also have the, what's the word I'm looking for? The um, come on, Paul. You're the one that thinks for me half the time up here. Um, you have the um, the sometimes regrettable task of having to uh, or the situation of having to live with your mistakes, and people will needle you and not let you forget those things, right? And sometimes the decisions we make when we make a decision is regrettable, and people don't let us forget it, right? I regret 
to inform you this morning that I typed this. See? And I had the responsibility, or I assumed the responsibility to do that, uh, and I shouldn't have done it. And the first one that said so was my wife. <laughs> and, and David talks about people like that. Now, my wife loves me, and that's why she said those things. But, um, for example, in verse uh, 2, David said, Oh my God, I trust in you. Let me not be ashamed. Let not mine enemies triumph over me. When you have options and decisions to make, anybody that doesn't necessarily agree with you is going to let you know if you make a mistake. And you will regret the day you made that mistake. David in this psalm knows that only God can keep him from regret through the dirty tricks that life plays on you. Look at verse... 15, for example. Mine eyes, David said, are ever toward the Lord. I'm always looking at Him, for He shall pluck my feet out of the net. Back in those days, I don't know if any of you have ever read anything on ancient history, but even in the days of the Romans, uh, there were gladiatorial games that they used to play in the arenas. It was like hockey and football is for us, you know. They'd pit people against people. And usually they would train people that went to jail or slaves or people that were taken away from their countries as b booty of war. And they would train these people to become either swordsmen or uh, they would fight with a trident, which was a, was a, a big net with a spear, with a, with a, a, like a pitchfork in their hands. And they would match these people off together in, in front of the crowds for sport. Right? And the net was an, an instrument that a person would use. Uh, the, the fellow that fought with a trident with a three-pronged fork on one hand and a net with which to snare his enemy on the other hand. Any hunter knows that a net is used to capture a bird. And uh, although we don't usually use that procedure today with the onset of technology you don't need it but back in the olden days a net was very common and it it is illustrative of the of the tricks of the snares that life has for us only God can deliver us from those things and many of us in this room today if we had the time to share the testimony could talk about the nets that we have fallen into in our lives things that we didn't see and it just got us by surprise and we can regret. We do regret those things sometimes. And so all of these are indicators as to the, the theme that is in David's mind as he's praying this prayer to his Heavenly Father. David turns to God for help in the face of the troubles that cause him to act regrettably. Uh, I have seen people uh, act very unadvisably when they, you know, when they found out that they were sick. I have, I have seen people uh, completely opt out of a professedly Christian life because of a trial that came their way. And trials and our response to troubles and afflictions and difficulties, our reactions many times are very regrettable. The trials of life are one of those, they are one of those things that separate the men from the boys, as it were, in the Christian life. Right? Those that are mature and are prepared by God's Word and by listening to His advice as how to handle these things so that they don't make mistakes when troubles come. And that is probably the dominant theme in Psalm 25, the troubles. The whole ha last half of the psalm talks about David's troubles. And he is praying to God to help him so that he obviously would not act regrettably. So regret. How to keep from regretting life at the end. Did you know that Shakespeare, uh, when he died, or before he died, wrote uh, very illuminating words? He's held up as a very great man in English history and, Engl and literature. And uh, he was a complete cynic at the end of his life. He had uh, nothing positive to say. He said, life is like a complete waste. It reminded me, I, I can't quote the, what he said this morning, but I was reading it, and it's reminded me of Solomon's words in the book of Ecclesiastes, that life is vanity, all is vain. 
Life is like a shadow. It flits by, and what are we the better for it? Well, Solomon was regretting the choices that he had made. Now, let's look at Psalm 25 this morning briefly, just to look at some indicators that we, count, that we read here in David's prayer that can direct us to uh, how to avoid making regretful decisions and, and doing regretful things in our lives. An intensely personal prayer. Thirty-seven times David refers to himself in these verses. About ten times he refers to God. The psalm begins, O Lord, verse 2, O my God, verse 4, O Lord, verse 6, remember, O Lord, verse 7, the last of the verse, for thy righteousness sake, O Lord. So David is obviously praying to the Lord, his God, and he is talking about his own experience here. The Holy Spirit has seen fit to write this down through David for our benefit because there are eternal, abiding, unchanging principles that still apply to the human condition regardless of whether this is 3,000 years old. All right? It's a very old poem, but it, it has tremendous insight on our experience. Now, the psalm divides into two parts. The first seven verses are basically the same as the last... Um, uh, verses in verses 8 to 22. They're both petitions. Both of these uh, sections in the psalm contain petitions by David to God to help him right now. Isn't it interesting that when you have trouble, you want help now. You don't want it tomorrow. You want it now. Does that make sense? Yes. And all the petitions, petitions of David in this psalm are present tense. He wants them now. He wants God to do something now. All right? However, David's perspective, his, his thinking behind his petitions is what divides these, these petitions into two groups. The first seven verses are David's petitions based on the past experience that he has had with the living God. Um, for example, in, in verse 6 and 7, he, three times he asked God to remember. Well, when you remember something, you're going back into the past, are you not? He's asking God, God, you remember these things. All right? And he alludes in, verse, um, in the last part of verse 6 to your loving kindnesses, for they have ever been of old. And the very fact that David is talking to a God that he gives certain titles to indicates that David has in the past had an ongoing relationship with God. This morning, people, the very starting place for this whole exercise or this whole study is this, that you're going to get nowhere in avoiding the pitfalls of life. You're going to bumble through life and do all kinds of things that you regret if you don't know God. That's what it starts out with. David only... Only the person who is like David can go to God for help with his, prob with his troubles. Right? And so David here is talking about a God. He's talking to a God with whom he has already had a past experience. He, know he has known in the past that God lives. All right, in the first two verses, we have David. David starts out with a profession of faith. This is what I've just been talking about. Unto thee, David says, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. O my God, I trust in thee. And about ten times in his psalm, David refers to his own faith. Uh, look at verse 3. Yea, let none that wait on thee be ashamed. He's talking about people who will sit still and depend on the Lord. Wait. Look at verse 5, the last phrase. On thee do I wait all the day. Skip down in the psalm to verse 12. What man is he that fears the Lord? That fears the Lord. Verse 14. The secret of the Lord is with those who fear Him. Fear doesn't mean shaken in your boots. None of us is, is like that this morning. None of us is sitting here just petrified that God is going to cave this roof in on our heads. No. That's not what it means when you're talking about the fear of God. Fear is a very sober-minded, realistic attitude towards your Maker. You recognize His reality, you know how strong He is, and you reverence Him because of who He is. It's a deep respect and reverence. That's what fear is. And it's synonymous with trust and dependence and faith. 
Look at verse 15. David describes his faith. Mine eyes are ever toward the Lord. Verse 20, the last part of the verse. For I put my trust in thee. And verse 21. Let integrity and uprightness preserve me, for I wait on thee. The psalm opens, and all the way through the psalm, David talks about his faith. That's the starting place. David begins with his profession of faith. Um, Unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. If you go to the scriptures, you begin to read things about the soul. In uh, Hebrews 6.19, Jesus Christ is called the anchor of the soul. In 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 23, we are told that only Christ is able to preserve our body and our soul and our spirit blameless until the day of Christ. Only Christ can preserve our soul. In Matthew 10.28, Jesus admonished his listeners, there's only one person you need fear in life, and that's the one that can destroy both your body and your soul in hell. Who's that? It's not the devil. Jesus Christ has ripped the keys and the power of death out of the hands of the devil. And today, Jesus Christ holds the keys of life and death. And so, Jesus is the one that we need to fear. He's the one that can destroy your soul. So, unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. Yes, David is expressing his faith to the Lord. To the Lord. O my God, I trust in thee. God is a living God to David. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10, the Apostle Paul said essentially the same thing. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men. We trust in the living God who is the Savior. People, if you don't believe God exists, then you'll never have any trust. It starts right there. Um, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. Uh, For without faith it is impossible to please Him. For he that comes to God must believe, first, that He exists, and secondly, that He rewards those that diligently seek Him. The starting place for a relationship with God is you have to believe in His existence. Number two, if you want God to reward you, if you want Him to give you anything in life, you have to depend on Him. Because you can't please Him any other way. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. And if you want to end up at the end of life as an old man or as an old woman, and to be able to look back on a life with no regrets, this is where it starts. You have to be like, a, like David. You have to be a person of faith. Now, in, in verses 2 to 7, in this first section of the psalm, all of David's petitions, and there are several listed here, can be categorized into three groups. And, and we're going to spend most of our time this morning, because we don't have much anyway, we're going to spend most of our time just on these remaining verses in verses 2 to 7, because the three categories of petitions that David lists here are basically duplicated in the latter part of the psalm. There's nothing new later on in the psalm. Right? Everything that he asked for here, he asked for later, a second time. But there's three basic categories of petitions. Petitions. In verses 2 and 3, the first major sort of request that David asked for is that he would not be ashamed. That he would not be ashamed. Let's read it. Let me not be ashamed. Count up the number of times it occurs. Let not mine enemies triumph over me. That's essentially a synonymous phrase. Somebody laughing at you and making you ashamed. Yea, verse 3, Let none that wait on thee be ashamed. Let them be ashamed who transgress without cause. If you put all those things together and, and simplify it, what David is starting with in his, in his prayer is God... Please don't let me end up ashamed at the end of my life. I don't want to be ashamed. And he's asking God to keep him from that. If you compare Scripture with Scripture, um, this, is, this is what the Apostle Paul said about shame. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12, for which cause, he said, I suffered these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. 
Why? Because I know who I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, when you meet God, you will not be put to shame. Can you imagine what it would be like? Uh, suppose the Almighty God walked through that door this morning. Come on, think about it. Suppose God walked through that door this morning, and He came down here and He started looking into your heart this morning. You, and you, and you, and you, and me. You, might, you imagine how big of a fool you are going to feel like if you all your life have said, ah, God's not real. It's going to make you feel real small, isn't it? Sure. Uh, a lot of people think that one of the worst things about... Uh, well, a lot of us imagine that one of the worst things about that could happen in life is that we will go to hell. Yeah, that's pretty bad, all right. But a lot of people will do a, a lot of things in life to keep from being centered out or, or uh, you know, made to look like a fool. Our pride is one of the things that uh, people will go to almost uh, infinite lengths to keep from being shown up in front of other people. Well, that's going to be part of the judgment of the unsaved someday. And no Christian will ever experience that. Uh, Romans chapter 10, verse 11. When you put your faith in Christ, He automatically does something for you. For with the heart man believes to righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the Scripture says, Whosoever believes on Him shall not be ashamed. You will not be put to shame. By Christ. Now, I, there's there's a corollary to that. It's one thing to have the confidence that when we stand, someday stand before God, we'll never be put to shame and we'll have no regrets because I am a believer. That's one side of the truth. But for Christians, it's pretty obvious to us that it's possible to walk two different paths down here in this life. And it's possible for a Christian to be able to stand before God someday not ashamed because he is a believer, but at the same time, terribly ashamed for the lifestyle he lived. And there's two ways that the New Testament says that you can keep from being ashamed. And I, I think this is probably what David is thinking about when he asks this prayer. He's, when he's praying these requests, Lord, don't let me be ashamed. Don't let my enemies win over me. And then he says, and the clue to what he means by ashamedness is given in the last part of verse 3, let them be ashamed who transgress without a cause. Who transgress without a cause. Why didn't he just say, let them be ashamed who transgress? What's the difference between transgressing and transgressing without a cause? I don't think there is any difference. There's no, there's no real reason why anybody should transgress. Is there? Is there any good reason why you can go ahead and sin? The only thing that will cause a believer to be ashamed, a believer to be ashamed before the Lord, is sin. Second uh, Timothy chapter two verse fifteen, for example, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Can you imagine what you're going to feel like when you stand in heaven and you see Zephaniah? The prophet Zephaniah. Who's that old man? Oh, that's the prophet Zephaniah. Well, who's he? I never heard of him. And so Zephaniah hears you talking about him. He comes over and says, Hi, my name's Zeph. Who are you? Um, you, never, you, never heard, you, never, you never read my book? It's in the Bible. It's the third last book in the, New, the Old Testament. You never read that book? God, God told me to write that book for you. How are you going to feel when you stand before Mark in heaven and you never read the Gospel of Mark through? Or Paul? Yeah. Or some of these people that died for Christ and you didn't have enough gumption to even read what they wrote. You see how you're going to feel someday? If you choose to go the way of the world, study, be diligent to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, not to be ashamed. You don't need to be ashamed someday when you stand before the Lord. But you will be 
if you don't fulfill the condition. I don't think there's anything that causes people to be more ashamed in this life than to be shown to be an ignoramus. <laughs> be shown to be an ignoramus. You fool. You know, I, I, I cringe at the thought of having to stand up in front of somebody and preach something and then to be shown up by somebody that I'm speaking to that what I said was you know, completely out of whack, completely wrong. I was shown to be a fool. I would blush because I would be ashamed. Right? And the only way to keep from being ashamed is to know what you're talking about. Study diligently. See? And David says, let me, let me not be ashamed. Do you regret that you've never read the Bible through? Do you regret that you've never, you, you can't answer people's questions, that you can't even talk to somebody about Christ because you don't know enough? Let me not be ashamed. There's no excuse for it. Let them be ashamed who transgress without a cause. Something else that causes believers to be ashamed, and that is sin. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 28 and 29. Now John says, little children, abide in Christ, that when he shall come back, when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone that does righteousness is born of him. When Jesus Christ comes back, what's he going to catch you doing? What is he going to catch you doing? Reading a Playboy magazine? Watching a filthy video? Wasting time when you should have been doing something profitable? in bed with someone else's wife? What's he going to catch you doing? Uh, that is a very sobering question. And there's only one way to keep from being ashamed at the appearing of Christ. And that is to just stay with him like this right now. And if you're always doing right, if you're always in fellowship with the Lord, if you're always abiding in him, you'll not be ashamed comes back. So David's first panel of requests here is that he would not be ashamed. He doesn't want to be, he doesn't want to have any regret when he sees the Lord. All right, the second group of requests are found in verses 4 and 5. The petitions basically are that God would guide him. Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth. Teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. On thee do I wait all the day. These requests are duplicated several times throughout the psalm. For example, in 8b, the Lord will teach sinners in the way. The meek, he will guide in justice. The meek, will he teach his way. All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth unto such as keep his covenant and his testimonies. Verse 12b, him shall the Lord teach in the way that the Lord shall choose. All right? And we don't have time to go through the rest of them, but David is asking God for guidance. Again, all you have to do is put yourself in David's shoes to get the significance of this. Who was David? He was a man with great responsibility. What was he supposed to do when he, when he finds out that uh, a bunch of people are... Um, not paying their taxes in such and such territory. What's he supposed to do when uh, he finds out that the king north of him and the king south of him are have secretly bound themselves together in a military alliance to, uh, to put him in the middle to attack him? What's he supposed to do? What's he supposed to do when he finds out his son behind his back has been uh, tricking him and trying to get people to support him to, to cause a civil war in the country. What's he supposed to do? And there are a multitude of heavy-duty decisions that a person in his responsibility has to make. What am I supposed to do? I don't want to make a decision that I'm going to regret, Lord. Some of you young people haven't been married yet. I guess most of you. <laughs> that was a really intelligent statement. Uh, 
I'm ashamed. <laughs> um, but I hope that it, the decision that you make with the options that confront you won't be a decision that someday you're going to regret. Because a lot of people regret the decision they made in that area. It's one of the most important decisions you'll ever make. Right? And, you, and the only way to avoid regretting such a decision is to do what David did when you've got a big decision to make, and that is lean on the Lord's guidance. Help. Show me. Teach me. Guide me. Right? Now, it's, a lot of us are, are well, I, I would say maybe 101% of us are lazy at heart. It's so much easier to get up in the morning and say, Lord, I don't know what I'm supposed to do today. I really don't know what to do about that. Help me. And then we leave our Bible shut. Right? God isn't going to help us by speaking audibly through a cloud or through a tree or in our radio. You know, we turn our radio on. Hello, this is God speaking. This is what you should do today. No, God doesn't operate like that. He's already spoke. It's right here. And if you want to know what God's guidance is for the decisions of life, all you do is read it. He that hath an ear, the New Testament says, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Right? A closed Bible is like a closed ear. All right? And so, if you don't want to rue the day when you made a bad major decision, well, then you better know what the Bible says about it. And the Bible is very plain about marriage, for example. Um, Christians shouldn't be unequally yoked with another person. That doesn't mean you shouldn't just marry a non-Christian. A lot of Christians shouldn't marry other Christians because there's just some real bad Christians out there. There's godly Christians and apathetic Christians and busy Christians and sinning Christians and immoral Christians and lazy Christians and you know, all kinds of Christians out there, and God says, don't you pick another person that doesn't match you. Now, uh, that's only one example I picked, right? But about a financial decision, what am I supposed to do, right? What you do so that you don't regret the decisions of life is always take God into account. He's spoken, listen to what he has to say. As simple as that. In verses 6 to 7, we have the final group of petitions that we'll have time to look at, and that is petitions basically that God would think about them. First, David asked God not to let him be ashamed. Second, he asked God to guide him. Thirdly, in verses 6 to 7, if you put these things together, he's asking God to think about it. To think about it. Now, I don't know why David said this. Uh, maybe it's because we uh, we uh, <laughs> are so um, we have such mental problems that we we think that the rock is going to move. You know, that we think something wrong something's wrong with God or something, right? And so we uh, please don't move, Lord. You know, don't forget about me. That's it's almost comical. Look at it. Remember, O oh Lord. Thy tender mercies and thy loving kindnesses, for they have been ever. Well, do you think God's going to forget what he's like? Does God have to remember who he is? No. No. He never forgets who he is. I think maybe this is more an expression of uh, weakness on David's part. Uh, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 6. Uh, Jesus Christ is saying yesterday, today, and forever. Right? I like this the statement in the in the last book in the Old Testament, Malachi chapter three, verse six. Um, God said something of great import to the Jews. He said, I am the Lord, I change not, therefore ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Aren't you glad God is a merciful and long suffering God? I am. If he ever stopped being long suffering, I'd be gone. So would you. Right? And so what it boils down to is uh, God doesn't change. But our perceptions of Him change. We forget about Him. We lose sight of the rock that doesn't move. Right? And so in our prayers, it's a good thing for us to remind ourselves. I guess maybe there's nothing wrong with asking God to stay with us. Uh, a lot of times when I hear Christians pray, I, I wonder, you know, 
where did they get their theology? I don't know how many times I've heard Christians pray, Dear Lord, be with us today. You ever thought about that? That's like David asking God not to uh, forget his own mercies and loving kindness. It's absurd for God to not be with us today. Lo, I am with you always, Jesus said, even to the end of the earth. I abide in you and you in me. No, we don't have to pray that, but I guess he's long-suffering when, he, when we pray stupid prayers. Um, and then the next phrase, remember not the sins of my youth. I suppose this is the one that we could key in on, isn't it? Remember, there's some things, Lord, I, I please, would you just forget? <laughs> just block it out. And you know, the Lord is gracious because he does. He not only forgets, but he buries it. He removes it. Our sin from us as far as the east is from the west. We certainly shall reap the results of our sin. For example, uh, uh, and by the way, they're sins of the youth. Remember not the sins of my youth. In uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22, the Apostle Paul says, And thou, O man of God, flee youthful lusts. Why does he call them youthful lusts? Well, because when you're a child, a lot of the potential problems in life are up here. And you're walking around down in the grass down here, see? And you don't see those things, and they don't bother you. You don't fall into fornication when you're six years old, usually. I mean, that's a youthful sin, all right? right? It's when your hormones start working that you start to fall into those things, and you have hormones for the rest of your life, you see? And so the, the sins of my youth, they are characterized by potential problems and temptations that first blossom in youth and which we always deal with thereafter. And it's true. The scriptures say very plainly that you reap what you sow. For example, to use the sexual example, if a person yields in his youth to uh, a one-night fling and gains... Uh, you know, an irreversible sexually transmitted disease. The Bible says you will reap what you sow. God isn't going to heal you from your sexually transmitted disease. You asked for it. Now, he will forgive your sin, and you can be restored to fellowship. And in his great mercy, he may help you, uh, you know, in some miraculous way. But you see how it works? Remember not the sins of my youth. The Lord is very gracious towards us. He has immutable laws, however, at the same time. All right? And let's, let's uh, do like David. When we have made mistakes in the past, let us go to the Lord in prayer and, uh, and, and throw it on Him. Isn't it wonderful? And 1 John 1, 7, the blood of Jesus Christ continually cleanses us from all sin. From all sin. And so the Lord doesn't remember our sins, our youthful sins. He doesn't remember them. He's forgotten them. And you've got to believe that. Christian, if you have done something you're supremely ashamed of in your youth or any time in your life, if you've confessed it, if you've trusted Christ, he promises that he has removed it as far as the east is from the west. And when you stand before him on the judgment day, that will never come up. The only thing that comes up on the judgment day is whether or not you have done beneficial or worthwhile or worthless things as a Christian. The sins are forgotten. The sins are cleansed. You read it in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. All right? Well, that's for Christians we're talking about. And I believe that every sin an unsaved person has ever done will come up. <laughs> that's a different ball of wax. Right? Unsaved people haven't had their sins washed away by the blood of Christ. And when the books are open on that great judgment day, boy, there's going to be a lot of tears and crying and shame. Well, we haven't quite got finished through here, but I think there's three things that we can draw out of these verses that we've looked at this morning. To avoid regret... Uh, you can avoid regret by avoiding shame. How do you avoid shame? Well, by first of all, believing in Christ so that you won't be ashamed as a non-believer when he returns. You can avoid shame by working for him diligently, as it says in 2 Timothy 2.15. Be diligent so you won't be an ashamed workman when he comes back. By abiding in him. Right? 
So avoid being in a position where you'll be put to shame by the returning Lord. Secondly, you can avoid regret by not going wayward, by not just going your way. Instead, you follow His way. You lean on His guidance. You learn what He says, as David asked, for guidance. And if you want to avoid regretting your own decisions in your own way, well, go His way. It's simple, isn't it? If you've got two paths and you know this one's going to take you a tough route, we'll follow this one, his way. Right? Simple. And that's, this is the book that shows you what his way is. Thirdly, you avoid regret by avoiding youthful sins. By running from sin when you see it. Don't play with it. Run from it. A fellow by the name of Arthur Whaley said, Keep off your thoughts from things that are past and done. For thinking of the past wakes regret and pain. Now, that was a worldly author, and I don't agree with his advice. A lot of people run away. They just blank out their past. They don't want to deal with it, and so they don't think about it. They try to drown their sorrows in alcohol and drugs and entertainment and music and everything else. So they don't have to meditate or think. And Christians, one of the most important things you can do, I believe, to keep yourself from ever doing anything that you'll regret is to be sober-minded. Be a, become a meditative Christian. What we need to do is turn off the sound, turn off the entertainment, and do a little more serious thinking about our life. Instead of forgetting the past, and there is a place for forgetting what's gone behind, because the Apostle Paul did that, Philippians chapter 3, those things which are gone, he said, I you know, leaving those things which are behind and pressing for those things which are before. All right? You strive. But, in a sense, there is a wrong way to forget the past, and that is when you try to ignore it instead of dealing with it. David wasn't ignoring his sin. He wasn't ignoring his past. He was simply calling on God to help him because God has shown himself in the past to be real. Uh, it's a very practical psalm. If you want to, if you're struggling with troubles in life, uh, instead of temptations, but I mean life has just been hard for you, read the rest of this psalm and see how David handles that so that you don't res respond to your troubles in a regrettable way. How did David respond to it? He became a man of prayer. One of the greatest devices that you can have and develop to overcome troubles in life is to become a praying person. All right, that's all we've got time for this morning. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a God that is long-suffering, that you do not change, that you are still the rock of our salvation. You are a God that completely wipes away our sin when we confess it to you. We thank you and praise you for that. What a wonderful gift. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would help us to be able to uh, in faith, confess our sins and then expect you to just forgive it and forget it and then we can forgive ourselves. Father, help us not to ignore our sins and presume that we can ignore you and at the same time ignore our own past. Such is folly. We pray, Father, that each of us in this room this morning would become realistically minded, sober thinking people that we would recognize that the choices we make each day, the things we do, they, are, they will either cause us to be ashamed someday before you, or you will catch us in the act, or we will have already laid down a lifestyle that we cannot change and that someday we will re terribly regret. And Father, you have given to us these seeds, these clues to keep us from doing these things. Help us, Father, to rejoice instead of regret by walking with you, confessing our sin, totally trusting in you, we pray in Jesus' name.